Because if you tell a Brit that he can't go see a band, he's going to go see that oh, band. Yeah. 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 So here was the establishment telling the British audience, you cannot go see Alice Cooper. I mean, we were sitting there going, we couldn't pay these people to say that any better than that. Hi, I'm Nick from Enemy, and for the latest episode of our In Conversation series, it's an absolute honor to be joined by the godfather of shock rock himself. It's Alice Cooper. How are you? How are you doing, Nick? Good to see you. How are you? I'm great. Everybody's great here. We're just like every other band. We're sort of like racehorses ready to start the race. If we could just tell us that we could go on tour, it'd be great. <laughs> this is it. I mean, it's been obviously, that goes without saying, the strangest of years. But for someone that is as renowned a live performer as you are, what was it like to just be like, right, I've got a down tools for a year. There's nothing I can do. How's the last year been for you? Well, it's been, you know, it's, it's so unusual to be, have a year off. If yeah. we have three weeks off, it's a, it's a long time, you know? So having a year off, just what I think that you're going to find most musicians have got studios in their house. So I'd say this year and next year, there's going to be an avalanche of music coming out because all these musicians are writing and they're all recording. And, and so I'm already working on the next album and the Detroit Stories album isn't even out yet. Yeah. And I'm working on the next Hollywood Vampires album. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of music coming out in the next year. But, you know, for me, maybe it was OK to have a year off. Yeah, maybe it was OK to rest up for a year. But we had to cancel 180 cities around the world. But it looks like the end is finally in sight. I mean, you had your vaccine uh, yeah. the last week. How was that process? How are you feeling in the wake of that? You must be just like raring to get going you know, again. It's not a it's not a hard shot at all. It's an easy shot. And, uh, you know, I and I get my next one, I think, in March 2nd. Mm. But in Arizona right now, they're doing 10,000 people a day. Wow with the shots. So there it's getting, like you said, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is, uh, is definitely in sight. This is it. I mean, all the signs are there. And most importantly, we've got new music from you next Friday sees the release of Detroit stories, which is your, is it's your 21st solo album. I'm right in saying. Uh, I think it's my 29th or 28th studio album. Yeah. And, and you know, it was, it's about, it's, if you come to the United States, you realize that, all of the cities on the coastal things are sort of the glamorous cities. Yeah. You know, Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York and or New Orleans, Boston. But Detroit is the Midwest and that's the home of hard rock. Yeah. You know, when we first went there, we met the MC5 and Iggy and the Stooges and Susie Quattro and Ted Nugent and Bob Seger and, and we fit right in because we were a hard rock band. And I was actually born in Detroit. Mm. So I was, I was the long lost son, you know, that finally came home. And that's where the Alice Cooper band broke. We were uh, 18, that's where that song and, and Love It To Death, the first real Alice Cooper album came out of Detroit. And it's almost like this is a autobiographical album in a way, I know you're looking back at the past. What was it like to go back to Detroit? I know uh, Bar Joe Bonamassa, you kind of had an album that's got all Detroit players on it. What was it like to just go back and relive those memories in this album? Well, it was kind of interesting for one thing is I surround myself with the very best players. Yeah. I mean, I've always surrounded myself with the best guitar players, with the best drummers, the best everything. So my, even with the vampires, the vampires band is just absolutely the best players around. And when we went to Detroit and said, let's use all Detroit players, I realized that Wayne Kramer from MC5 plays better now than he did then. Yeah. Johnny B on drums is a better drummer now than he was then. So all of these, uh, Mark Farner from uh, Grand Funk, all of these players were on the top of their game. And uh, it, we made the album very quickly, actually, because I wanted to do it live in the studio. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do layer after layer after layer like you do in a bit. You know, if you're doing Welcome to My Nightmare, that's one of those produ production albums. But this album, I said, let's let's take this great band, teach them the songs and let's do all of these tracks live. 
because they were that good. Mm. And that's pretty much all the tracks you're hearing on the album are live tracks. There is a sense of rawness and urgency that kind of certainly reminded me of the earlier spirit of Alice Cooper. And to that end, in terms of like the scene that was in Detroit at the time, it's so funny because you've got hard rock, but then at the other end of things, you've got Motown, which are these two incredibly different scenes, but then coming together in this same city, which is just the strangest of paradigms. This was the strangest thing, Nick. When we were in Detroit, it would be like a, a, a regular night on a weekend. Yeah. It would be Alice Cooper and the Stooges and Bob Seger and The Who. And The Who, you know, back then, they didn't play arenas. They played, um, you know, ballrooms or a thousand seat rock club. Because th those, those bands like Savoy Brown and, you know, all those big bands uh, from England, we were not playing arenas. Uh, so we opened every single weekend for those. And we'd look down in the audience and there'd be 1,100 rock and rollers, black hair, black leather jackets. And then you'd see Smokey Robinson. Yeah. Then you'd see two of the Supremes. And then you'd see one of the guys from the Four Tops. All of the Motown guys used to come to the rock shows. And it was not unusual. Uh, if there was a if there was a, a big rhythm and blues uh, festival or something going on, I would say a huge amount of that audience were white white kids with mm. long black hair and you know hippies, because we never saw any color. Music was just music. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, Motown was just valid as to us as hard rock was. And uh, it, it's funny that there just wasn't any. Uh, there wasn't a color problem at that point. And why do you think it was Detroit? I know you've kind of said that perhaps um, LA wouldn't have been home of the hard rock scene. I mean, like it just wasn't there. Why was it that Detroit really took uh, hard rock to heart, do you think? Well, you know, it's mid-America and mid-America works in factories. And in that point of view, most of the people in mid-America in Detroit, at least, people went there to work for Ford or Chrysler or Chevrolet or all this. And I think that the sound of the machines was something that they heard all day. And these were all, you know, average American, you know, not rich, not poor, but right in the middle. And it was not sophisticated. So they didn't want their bands to be sophisticated. They wanted their bands to be street. You know, they wanted in, in England, it would have been like the clash. Yeah, it would have been like bands like that, you know, that were not really sophisticated bands. Um, and that's who we were. Now, the thing that we did, though, we added that theatrical topping on it. And the Stooges had their own brand of theater. I mean, Iggy himself was theater. You know, the MC5 were a show band and they were very political. They were the White Panthers, you know, <laughs> and always in trouble <laughs> so most of the detroit bands i think people wanted their music to be like what they heard all day and those giant machines and the funny thing is is after saying that i read an article by iggy and he said the exact same thing yeah he says people wanted their music to be like the machines and like that sense of familiarity going from just like going from hearing it to work to hearing it but like to a different degree yeah and, and and they certainly did not want a band that didn't have attitude mm. they were an attitude you know they wanted their bands in their face with without any you know the, the soft rock did not work in in detroit at all and it's funny because i know um, next month incredibly it's going to be the 50th anniversary of love it to death does it feel like 50 years? Like, do you kind of think that was a while ago when I'm recording this, or is it one of those things where you're like, the whole thing is just absolutely flown by? Well, it, it really has gone by. And I'm not one of those guys that lives in the past at all. Yeah. In fact, people thought that I did this Detroit album as a tribute to Love It To Death coming out. It's a, totally a coincidence. Right, okay. I, mean, I didn't even think about that. People have to remind me that it's the 40th anniversary of this album or the 20th anniversary of that album, you know, because I just don't live in the past like that. You know, I'm thinking about what's the next album going to be. What's, you know, who am I going to use on it? What are the lyrics going to be? I appreciate 
the history of Alice Cooper, but I, I don't live there, you know? And just the live shows that came with that album, I guess, like one of the first times that you really pioneered shock rock, I mean, for the first time. When you kind of like went out there, did you kind of really want to like disrupt the system and have something that would make people shock? Or was it just you trying to do something something, something different, do you think? Well, it was, it was, you know, shock rock, it was easy to shock an audience in 1969, 1970, yeah, 70s. When we came to England, I mean, oh, they were so shocked. They were I mean, so famously, up. there was there was calls for you to be banned from this. Oh, country. yeah, I, which, were, which were totally in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if you tell a Brit that he can't go see a band, he's going to go see that oh, band. Yeah. 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 So here was the establishment telling the British audience, you cannot go see Alice Cooper. I mean, we were sitting there going, we couldn't pay these people to say that any better than that. And so, of course, Schools Out went right to number one, you know, and yeah. we sold out every ticket. And then we delivered. We gave them a show that they weren't expecting. Yeah. And we gave them a band that they, they weren't expecting. You know, I mean, the band, usually when you get that much theatrics, you're not getting a great musical thing. If we were going to spend a, a rehearsal for eight hours, seven hours was on the music because we're up against Led Zeppelin. Mm. We're up against all these amazing bands. So we better come over there as a great band. And then the theatrics happen. You know, people always think that, that, that the, the attraction to Alice Cooper is the show. But I'm pretty sure people are coming to hear 18 and Billion Dollar Babies and Poison and oh, School cool. Sound and all those songs. And then they get the theatrics as icing on the cake. And it's funny because those theatrics, I know you were pioneering them in the early 70s. I know you've spoken about how one David Jones came over and saw those theatrics. And this was David Jones before Jones became Ziggy. And how do you think right. they, they it almost like influenced him in a way? He kind of realized what he wanted to become or? From what I understand, he used to bring the spiders from Mars to our shows and say, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. You know, and I never had a problem with, uh, you know, David and I got along really well. For one thing, he was going to do something theatrically that was entirely different from Alice Cooper. And he, his music, his early music, I really liked his early, early music. I, I kind of fell away when it got into dance and it got into Studio 54 kind of music. But, you know, the early stuff was really right up our, our alley. You know, it was the kind of stuff we went, wow, listen to Bowie's new stuff. But yeah, they all came to see us. You know, the only guy that we were at the same time was, was Arthur Brown. Mm. And Arthur and I had never met. I had never seen Arthur Brown with a makeup on. So it was a coincidence that both of us were doing the same kind of, you know, uh, character that was out there. And when I saw him, we ended up becoming very good friends. You know, I mean, to this day, Arthur is, is still a very good friend. As you were saying, the makeup, everything that fought was in fire in the early 60s, I guess, was the kind of first time that we had something like that over here. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I think Arthur was more influenced by Screaming Jay Hawkins, mm. you know, because they both had that operatic voice. They had a range that was like he could go really low or really high. And that's something that both of those singers had. Um, but as far as we were concerned, we had never honestly we were kids from the Midwest. We had never heard of Screaming Jay Hawkins. And he was American. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had heard of the Kinks and the Yardbirds and all the pretty things and bands like that. But we were not really interested in American blues bands, you know? And I know you said recently that you think that there's nothing that can shock audiences anymore. You think, you know, that perhaps they've seen it all. But um, is there any kind of artist uh, of a new generation that for theatricality, like, you know what, they're really putting on a show or really admire what they're doing. Well, musically, I really like a band from Ireland, The Stripes. Yeah. The Stripes' first album, I think, is one of the greatest first albums I've ever heard. Oh, wow. It, because there's a bunch of 18-year-old kids and they sound like the small faces and the yardbirds jamming with each other. And I mean, authentic, authentic rock and roll band that that band is very good very very good uh i like the strokes you know because they've got the they've got the flash and they've also got the songs and they got the attitude you know um i think that right now you know recently gene simmons said rock and roll is dead 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Gene Simmons, I would like him to do my taxes, you know, because <laughs> he's a businessman. Yeah. And maybe business wise, that's valid. But I guarantee you right now in London somewhere in garages, they're learning Aerosmith. They're learning Guns N' Roses. Bunch of 18 year old kids are in there with guitars and drums and they are learning hard rock. Same yeah. with the United States. There's all these young bands that are that want to resurge uh, that whole area of the of hard rock and outlaws. So in some ways, rock and roll is where it should be right now. We're not in the Grammys. We're not in the mainstream. Rock and roll is outside looking in now. And I think that gives us that outlaw attitude. And I think that's very good for rock and roll because that's how rock and roll started. You know, we were all outlaws at the time. And uh, then we became mainstream. But now, hey, you know, Foo Fighters, uh, Green Day, a lot of great hard rock bands out there. And to that end then, when you're kind of like talking about outsiders, do you think that there's definitely like a band out there that are kind of primed to burst? Do you think that in the way that the Alice Cooper bands did back in the day, there's going to be something coming up in years that will bring rock music back to the four packs? Yeah, I do. Uh, and I think that it's because it's a kind of music that you, that the one music, if you think of it, that started and never ended was hard rock. Mm -hmm. Because it went to punk, it went to, it went to disco, it went to hip hop, it went to grunge, it went to emo, it, it did all these things. But the one thing that went right through the middle of it was hard rock. The Rolling Stones were still the Rolling Stones. Aerosmith was still Aerosmith. Alice Cooper was still Alice Cooper. We, we survived those things because guitar driven hard rock is the only thing that will still be going 30 years from now, 40 years from now. And I think music will go all over the place, but you're going to find those hard rock bands still there. And um, in terms of other shock rock acts, perhaps, I know you famously you said that um, Marilyn Manson, you said, uh, look, he took his name from a female. Um, yeah. That's what I did first as the influence there. Um, to that end, I just wanted to ask, I mean, if you're aware of the, I know you talk, talked with him in the past, I want to aware, make, um, ask if you're aware of the allegations that have been made of um, against him by Evan Rachel Wood, or like whether, just what you kind of think about everything that's popped up about him in the last uh, week, week, few weeks or so. You know, it's funny about, about Marilyn in, in that I know Marilyn, which we toured together, we got along very well. I never noticed that streak in him if it's there. Mm. You know, I always believe in the word still allegations is still allegations. Sure. And you know, first of all, here's a prime example. Johnny Depp. Right. Johnny Depp and I are best friends. I have never seen him lift a finger for uh, against anybody. You know, he is the most gentle, one of the most gentle people. And all of his former girlfriends and wives say the same thing. So it's really hard to believe that all of a sudden he's going to turn into this monster, you know, and, and I know the guy with the guy on tour all the time. Uh, he's one of the most gentle, harmless people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. So now I don't know Marilyn though, as well yeah. as I know Johnny, you know? Um, so what happens in the bedroom is entirely a mystery to me for what's going on with Marilyn. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, I can just say that, all of those bands, uh, Rob Zombie, uh, you know, all the bands like that. And this is not out of ego, but no. they were all influenced by Alice because they saw it not just be theatrical, but also commercially and very valid. Yeah. You could make hit records and be theatrical. That was the one thing that we brought to it. Before that, theatrical bands, just the mothers of invention, let's say, you know, never had hit records. But all of a sudden, here was this monster, Alice Cooper, and hit record, hit record, hit record, hit record. We understood the power of those hit records. And so that's where Bob Ezrin came in. And really, he was our George Martin. He became our George Martin. He knew how to take what our, our insanity and put it on tape and make it work. And I mean, to that end, I know you're kind of like talking about recording. You said that your the pandemic has already given you a chance to think about what you might be doing next. I mean, when can we expect a, another Alice Cooper album after Detroit stories? Are you kind of raring to just get more stuff out there? Or? It's already in the works. Yeah. 
And there's, like I said, there's another vampire album in the works right now. Uh, I'm an optimist. I, yeah. I totally think that this thing is going to break open in six months. Yeah. And I think that touring is going to start again. And I think that concerts are going to start again. I mean, if you showed up at the concert and you had a certificate saying I had my shots, well, then why would you not go? What, what are you afraid of? You're already, you know, you're, you're not going to catch this disease anymore. So why not make concerts like that? You know, um, uh, vaccinate. Well, have a, a vaccine passport, as they're saying, isn't it? Where you can kind of prove that you've got it. And then that is your kind of pass into it. I mean, that's one of the things that's being suggested, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I believe, I, like I said, I believe everything's going to be much better in six months. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be on tour. I think uh, I know that in America right now, every major city is doing 10,000, 20,000 inoculations a day. Yeah. And so America is going to get pretty OK. Like Australia has zero cases now. Yeah. And New Zealand. I would love America to be there. And then you can start touring. And hopefully Europe catches up with that. You know, we can only hope. Yeah. And do especially you think, well, England. I mean, I miss London. I, I, I spend more time in London than I do in New York City. Were with touring or just like socially or I mean, I, I'm over there, I'd say five or six times a year. Yeah. You know, either touring or doing TV or doing, you know, press or whatever it is. Sometimes they just go, we just go there because we want to be in London. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the weirdest things. I mean, for me personally, when I've just been going up to uptown, like been suckling up and it's just been dead. And to see these kind of iconic places, just like a ghost town, hopefully yeah. there's life back in them sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I, and I think that people are going to see the advantage of let's get this, let's get this, these vaccines going, and let's yeah. get back to normal. So we That's can. It. But I think what you're going to see right now, in the next two years, you're going to see a tidal wave of albums coming out. And because all these musicians are sitting at home for a year, what do you think they're doing? They're writing, writing. recording, Maybe demoing yeah. songs. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna, you guys are gonna have so many albums coming out, you won't know what to do with them. <laughs> Here's hoping. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alex. Good luck with Detroit Stories. And when the shows do commence, hopefully we'll see you at one of them. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And uh, yeah, stay healthy. Okay, Nick.